This last presentation I'm going to give to you, this last in this Lenten series, is something that I have spoken on from the very beginning of my priesthood. Uh, I have spoken on this even before I was ordained a priest, although not to large groups of people. It's something that interested me from the day of my conversion. Uh, it's something that I knew intuitively was of en enormous importance. Now, I went off to Europe to study, to uh, earn my doctorate in sacred theology, and the thesis that I worked on, eventually wrote, successfully defended, published, that thesis expressed this particular talk. This is the summation. Actually, this is what I was most interested in all through my seminary years and into my priesthood. When I chose my thesis, I wanted to do something that just wasn't a dry doctoral work that would sit on a shelf and collect dust for many years. I wanted to do something useful. I knew I would minister to people. I knew that I would never be a professor because my uh, superiors told me that's not what I'm called to do, although I have the, creden the credentials to do it. I could do it, but I'm not called to do it. I don't have any particular gift for that. But I knew I'd preach, and I knew I would preach to people like you. I knew that eventually I would go all over the world and have to talk from the heart to some very special people, uh, so special that they're God's children. That's how special you are. And I wanted to be able to do something of value that every single human being could use at some point or another. My heart and my mind were moved toward the cross. Uh, the great question that has echoed throughout the centuries, a question which was punctuated on September 11th like never before, why? Why, if God is good, why so much evil? Why is there pain, suffering, and death? Why evil if God is good? If God is love, how can there be so much evil? If God is so merciful, why'd that happen on September 11? Now, that's what I studied for years. And the three years I was in Europe at the University of Navarre, I studied day and night on that particular topic, the meaning of human and Christian suffering. It is more relevant than ever. I remember when I was in the seminary, I used to consider that. I became acquainted with suffering years ago myself. In the seminary, I had terrible migraine headaches. I could uh, barely study. I could barely see several days a week. I would be in bed wondering how on earth I will ever get through my studies. So sick. And then right before exams, the headaches would clear up and I would uh, study intensely for 24 to 48 hours straight. And then I would take my exams and I'll always get the highest mark. And then the finals would come, and graduation would come, and always with highest honors. Why? Because I'm smart, no way. I'm average, extremely average. I was never anything other than average, or maybe even a little below average, growing up. My IQ was not particularly high average. But I always graduated at the top of my class. Five university degrees, two master's degrees, licentiate, a doctorate, 
Always at the top, and I was sick the whole time. I wonder how that happened. Well, God had a plan. And God knew no pain, no gain. No cross, no crown. I remember when I was over there studying my first semester at the University of Navarre in Spain, I went over there, uh, a relatively um, older man. I wasn't old, but I was, well, I was middle-aged if I live into my 80s. <laughs> I'm middle-aged right now, too, if I live to be about 110. <laughs> but I went over there, I didn't know the language, I hadn't yet learned Spanish. I took an intensive language institute. And I had to begin uh, graduate studies in a language I did not understand in a culture where I didn't really fit in. It was difficult. After a couple months of it, and I was sick there too, I called home to my superior in Texas, in Robstown, Texas right outside Corpus Christi. Yeah, we got, we got some folks here from Robstown. Well, I called Father Flanagan, and I got him on the phone, and I, and I was very depressed, very, very saddened. And I said, I don't think I can make it, Father. I'm just not called to this. I don't have, I just don't have the aptitude for it. After all, you know, I'm getting, I'm an aging man. My mind isn't as nimble as it used to be. I can't memorize things. I, I don't have an aptitude for languages. I had to learn new languages at the age of 40. I found it difficult. Classes were all in Spanish. And he said, I, I understand. He said, now refresh my memory. Why are you over there again? <laughs> and um, I said, well, you know, I'm here to get a doctorate in theology. And he said, oh, yeah. He said, you have to write a thesis to get a doctorate in theology, don't you? Said, That's right, Father. He says, uh, what is your thesis? I said, well, you remember, uh, my thesis is on the theology of the cross. <laughs> and, and there was a real long pause. <laughs> and he said, oh. He says, I get it. He says, do you? <laughs> and that was the end of that conversation. So I stayed in Spain for three years. Learned a little Spanish. Did my studies. Wrote my thesis. Again, graduated. Right up at the top where I wanted to be. And went on. And I've used it in preaching ever since, the cross. Why, though, why on earth would God permit evil? Do you know, do you understand where evil came from? God didn't create evil. Uh, when September 11th, those terrible events took place, they interviewed all kinds of people, including religious leaders. And the religious leaders, and I could have predicted it in advance, I've listened to it for years, nobody got it that I heard. Uh, does this te test your faith, reverend, cardinal, father, whatever? Oh, well, yes, it tests my faith, or, oh, well, it does, you know, we have to expect these things. Well, how, why is it? How, how come God could permit such a horrible thing? People that have been listening to me for 10 years were answering that question when it was asked on the tele television. Why does a good God permit evil? Now, that is a tremendous question, and if you know the answer to it, you have a lot of wisdom. If you have the answer to that question, you can respond to so many problems and dilemmas and crises in human existence. Why does a good God permit evil? Why does a good God permit pain and suffering? Why? To bring a greater good out of it. There's the answer. There's the bottom line. Now, we, we can begin to understand that a little better after September 11th. Now, I'm going to give you the real, I'm going to give you the real short theology course on this. I won't even have to speak a word. 
to explain to you why God allows so much evil. You understand? That's the cross of Christ. Do you understand that that in itself, the thing in itself is the greatest evil that could have ever happened? Do you understand Jesus is God, a divine person? The Creator is tortured by His creatures, deicide, the thing in itself. And yet that great evil is the greatest good that ever took place. You see the paradox of the cross, a great evil and yet an even greater good. September 10th, I boarded an airplane in San Francisco to fly down to Los Angeles to minister at my father's funeral the next day, September 11th. I woke up early in the morning, as I always do, and that's September 11th, preparing to celebrate Mass with Father Flanagan, who was with me at the time for my father's funeral. The lady who manages my office called and said, turn on the television fast, something bad is happening. I don't know what, but it's awful. And I turned it on, and then Father Flanagan and I saw it live. We saw the second plane hit, second tower, we saw the rest of it. Then we went off, drove to the chapel, walked in, and there my dad's casket was. And on that casket was an American flag and a crucifix. And it struck me. It all crystallized and made sense in my head. Why evil? Why pain? Why would a good God allow all of those horrible things to take place? Why all those innocent people slaughtered? Why? On September 10th, we in this country were extremely divided still. You remember what had happened not too long before that in November. We couldn't hardly elect a president. You can't get much more divided evenly than we were in the country that previous November. This, this was a polarized country. Uh, a house divided must fall. We were in bad shape. On Monday, we were arguing and fighting about all kinds of inane and inconsequential things. On Tuesday, we were lined up giving blood. On Monday, children couldn't pray in schools. On Tuesday, you couldn't find a school where they weren't praying. <laughs> On Monday, and before Monday, there were dozens of abortions performed every day in New York City. After Tuesday, there weren't any for a while. Do you know Planned Parenthood had to give them away to drum up business? That's right. Before September 11th, there was plenty. But immediately in the wake of September 11th, there weren't any. You know, the pornography guys almost went out of business in the immediate wake of September 11th. Yeah, you think about this now. You know why? I know why. People got scared. No atheists in foxholes. <laughs> Hey, that, that next airplane might be coming through your living room window. Who knows? People just began to think. There, there was a fear. I, I know priests all over the country. 
The lines for confession were longer than any of them can remember. Hey, if you're going to come to God, we're supposed to do it out of love, but you know what? If you can't muster up any love for God, fear isn't a bad place to start. <laughs> Better nothing. And there was a certain fear. Now, that's not the best motive. Love is the right motive. But you've got to start somewhere. Churches were jam-packed from that weekend on. Now, I was preaching in Buffalo, New York, the previous weekend. I was notified Friday night after I preached my dad had passed away. I finished the mission, flew home, next day got on a plane, went down for the funeral. Walking through, I walk through airports all the time. I am a frequent flyer. I am a mighty frequent flyer. I have the highest rating United Airlines can give a frequent flyer. I'm a 100K flyer. I flew hundred and almost 160,000 miles last year. That's a lot of miles. Soon they'll be giving me stock in the company. <laughs> now, on any given day for the last many years that I've flown here, there, and everywhere, the general response to me is indifference. Now, I always look like this when I travel. I look like a priest. And uh, basic indifference, sometimes even intolerance. That was before September 11th. <laughs> the uh, weekend immediately after September 11th, I got on a I got on a plane. I had a mission. I got on a a big. I don't know if it was a 757, bigger than a 747. The next biggest plane, big one, a real big wide-body plane. I got on there, me and seven other people. <laughs> and when I, when I walked up the jetway, I started to come in the entrance to the plane, and the pilot spotted me, and he ran out and hugged me. And all the flight attendants gathered around like I was a movie star. <laughs> oh, Father, it's so nice to see you. <laughs> yeah, I bet you're glad to see me. <laughs> Everything had changed overnight. Why would a good God permit such evil? To bring a greater good out of it. Now, we wouldn't wish that on anybody, but let me tell you something. I'll extend it to the extreme example. When everything is going well, when we are making lots of money, we are healthy, everything is going well. No problems, no wars, no illnesses, no economic problems you begin to think you don't need God, right? Hey, I'm doing fine. I got no problem. Why, why should I pray? There's nothing wrong. Uh, you, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of people think that way, you know? They only pray in a crisis. They kind of think of God as a divine slot machine. <laughs> you put in a few prayers and hope to hit a jackpot. <laughs> Not the right way to approach God. Now, why does God permit these things? Straighten us out. Uh, my old Uncle Tony, who was a you know, real down-to-earth, relatively uneducated man, well, he had the, about the same education as most, most people in his day. He had about eighth, eighth, ninth grade, something like that. He had to go to work to help the family when he was, got to be about 14 or so. But he was a wise man, as many people from that generation are and were. And Uncle Tony used to say, well, you know, some people, you need to hit them right between the eyes with a two-by-four just to get their attention. <laughs> Don't you think for a minute that God won't hit us between the eyes with a two-by-four to get our attention? 
September 11th was a wake-up call. Why did God permit such an evil? Now, I'm not saying that the terrorists were working for God. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, the terrorists work for Satan, in case you're confused on that. In case you're not aware of that, the master terrorist is Satan. Oh, he is. I could give you some real long, involved talks on that one. But that's who they work for. Remember the old saying, no one does evil like those who do it in the name of God. And there's a tremendous truth to that. Uh, Satan gets people killing each other over religion all the time. Uh, every now and then, some pseudo-smart guy will say to me, oh, well, religion's bad. Uh, it causes wars. No, it doesn't. People do that. Oh, yeah, but, uh, you know, uh, even Protestants and Catholics fight in Northern Ireland. Yeah, people do that, but that's not about religion. That's about people who don't really practice their respective religion. I don't care if you Baptist or Catholic, you Christian, practice it. Why so much evil? Because we're not very smart and we just don't seem to get it. Year in and year out, though the years go by and we just don't get it. And so periodically, it's almost every generation, something like a war comes along, the two by four. My grandfather was in the army in World War I. My father was in the Navy in World War II. His younger brothers were in the war in Korea. My generation, myself, I enlisted in the Army, 1967, during the Vietnam War. Seems there's always a war. Then we had the Gulf War. And then we have this new kind of war against the terrorists. I can tell you from experience, from real life experience, there is nothing like a good old trauma to draw you close to God. I can guarantee you that there is nothing like a near brush with death to get you praying. Hmm? Maybe you've had that experience. Right? I've had some close calls in my life. It's too bad it's that way, but it is. But do you understand that it's not just a wake-up call? Pain and suffering has a pedagogical dimension to it, an instructive dimension to it. You remember, remember the uh, story, you remember, I just told it last night about the prodigal son? Uh, he wasn't very smart when he was young. He reminds me of me. Mm, that, with me, it started when I was about 15. You, are, you know all about 15, don't you? You all know about 15. 15 is that age whereupon you have gained all worldly knowledge, hence no one can tell you anything. <laughs> Not everybody 15 is like that, but I was. I thought I knew everything, and I didn't know much of anything. God permitted me to suffer eventually, to wake me up, to teach me, like the prodigal son. Hmm? Run off, squander the inheritance of my faith, live a loose, immoral life, and then everything falls apart. Sooner or later, it has to. The easy way is God's way. The hard way, even though it's the broad and, apparent and seemingly easy way, boy, that's tough. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. You, it's like masochism. You, you torture yourself by going down the road of sin. Don't do that. But beyond that instructive dimension of pain and suffering, why does God permit that? He permits it and even wills it in order to breathe life into the universe. There's a paradox here. Uh, we were morally dead before Jesus came and entered his passion, death, and resurrection. The gates of heaven were slammed shut. You understand that. From the original sin on, 
you look in the uh, book of Genesis, when we rebelled against our first parents, or rather against God, our first parents rebelled against God, what happened? The gates of heaven slammed. Could anybody go to heaven from that point on? No. No. What happened when you die? Go to heaven? No. Sheol, the abode of the dead. A dark and dismal place, at very best, could be a holding pattern for the just, because there were people who were decent and good, but they didn't go to heaven. It wasn't the hell of the damned, but it wasn't a pleasant thought. Can you imagine if you and I uh, had to face such a thing when we were going to die now? Can you imagine uh, how difficult it would be to face death? I, I, ima I can't imagine how it is for an atheist. With every tick of the clock, they're a second closer to nothingness, they think. Can you imagine that, that you're going to die and that you'll cease to exist? There's just nothing. You'll never see your family or friends again. What a horrible prospect that is. I don't know how anybody could be an atheist. Every tick of the clock, a second closer to the end. For us, every tick of the clock, a second closer to the beginning. Tremendous encouragement in that, hope in that. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to deliver from the law those who were subject to it. Galatians 4.4. Why did Jesus enter time and space? Why did the second person of the Blessed Trinity, the Eternal Word, the Father's only Son, why did he assume a human nature and become like, like one of us in everything except sin? Why? The word is redemption. We were in need of a savior. We were lost. We couldn't get into heaven. And so Jesus came, the Messiah. You know what the word Messiah means? The Christ, the Messiah, means the anointed. The anointed. Do you know what the, what the Messiah is anointed with and by whom he is anointed? The Messiah is Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. It is the Father who anoints them. And what is the anointing with which he is anointed? The Holy Spirit is the anointing with which Jesus is anointed by the Father. The oil of gladness, the power of God. It is necessary that I go, for if I do not go, the paraclete cannot come. It is necessary that Jesus go by way of the cross in order to send the Holy Spirit. In my own life, having gone the wrong way for many years, 20 to be exact, absolutely dead in my sins, my mind darkened, my, weak totally will, uh, my will totally weakened. I couldn't do a thing, couldn't do anything good, couldn't resist temptation dead. But Jesus can raise the dead, and often does. The anointing, the Holy Spirit, power. You good people have some intimation of the power of the Holy Spirit. We're in the uh, charismatic center of the Diocese of Houston. Now, you understand that word charism, where we get that charismatic charism. A charism is a special kind of a gift given to an individual by the Holy Spirit for the sake of the building up of the body of Christ, the church. I have a charism. I have a gift of apostolic preaching. I didn't give it to myself. And I didn't deserve it at all. I don't merit it, not one bit. <laughs> Matter of fact, a couple years ago, I was talking to uh, my superior, Father Flanagan, on the phone, and I said, gee, Father Jim, I can't really understand it. You know, I, I've only been preaching five years, and we're reaching tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people. I, I get mail delivered in bags. Uh, so many, so much fruit. Why? I can't understand it. He, did, he didn't even smile 
think about it, blink his eye, nothing. I, said, I just can't understand it. He said, that's easy. Uh, he couldn't find nobody worse. <laughs> now, you, you have to understand something about how God works, and there's a great truth in that. God chooses the weak and makes them strong in bearing witness to him. I know that I am weak. My life is a perpetual chronic testimony to human weakness. I mean, I was a drug addict, committed everyone in the book. Hopeless case. My mother prayed to St. Jude for me for many years. <laughs> the saint of hopeless cases, you know? <laughs> the pain and the suffering that I went through for several years, I wouldn't wish on anyone. Yet had I not gone through it, I could not do what I do. There is a power that comes from familiarity with the cross. For many, many years, I lived in a kind of pain emotional pain mostly, a kind of pain that was so intense uh, I couldn't believe it as, as I was enduring it. I just couldn't believe. I couldn't understand what it could be. It was eating me alive. It, it was hollowing me out. There was a kenosis, that's a Greek word, an emptying out that was taking place. Why? Because in order to be filled up, you've got to be emptied out, and the emptying part is painful. We don't like that part of it. Now, the Holy Spirit is a divine artist. We're like a lump of clay. We've heard that analogy that we're clay. We, we carry this treasure within us in earthen vessels. We know uh, an artist, a sculptor, can work with clay. Clay is soft. Clay is malleable. Clay can be easily formed. The Holy Spirit's the divine artist. Are you clay or are you marble? Artists can work with marble too, right? Uh, marble's very cold and hard though. How does an artist work with marble? Hey, he chips away at it. <laughs> You've been wondering why God's chipping away at you? It's painful to lose pieces of yourself, isn't it? Got to do it. There are things in us that have to go. You can't be egocentric, you've got to be Christocentric. You can't be self-centered and hope to be sanctified. You've got to be centered on Christ. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit forms Jesus within us. And no cross, no crown, no pain, no gain, no way around it. If there was a shortcut, I'd know it and I'd tell you. <laughs> but there isn't any shortcut and I've been looking. I have been looking for years. No shortcut. You've just got to walk the way that Jesus walked. I know talk is cheap. I know it's easy to talk and hard to act. The older I get, the more respect I have for human beings, especially human beings who've lived for a while, although young people have their struggles and their difficulties and their crosses as well. Uh, the uh, crosses of youth can be very difficult. The crosses of middle age can be indeed difficult as well. And the crosses of advanced age are yet another thing. But as I grow old, the thing that I come to is respect for people. Uh, I, I look out at you, and I do this all the time because that's what I do, I preach. I look out at you and I, can, I see individuals here. I know I don't know most of you. I don't know your names. I may never meet you again. But when I'm looking out at you, there has to be a reverence because I know where you came from and I know where you're headed. I know you have suffered things in your lives and I know yet you will suffer more things before you come to the end of the trail. And yet there's power. There is power in it. 
From very early on, I had wished to be able to go up on the rooftops and shout out the power of the cross. I had wished from the beginning of my ministry to be able to, to go into every nursing home, every hospital, every home where an elderly person was shut in, and let them know the power of the cross of Christ. Do you understand to be raised up on the cross in Jesus is to be set at the pinnacle of human possibilities. Do you understand that? Why? For the very simple reason that no greater love hath a man but he lay down his life for his friend. There's no greater power position than hanging on a cross as long as you're in Jesus. And when you're baptized, you're brought into Jesus. When you're in a state of grace, you're in Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then there is efficacy. There is power in everything. Every breath you take, every beat of your heart, every step you walk, every word you speak is imbued with supernatural power. The power to do what the Master did, to set captives free. Set captives free. What a great thing. In a bored age, which we have, in an age which really doesn't understand the meaning of human existence, oh, if we could only convey it, you're called to greatness. And the only greatness is greatness in Christ. And Christ is a Savior. Oh, he's many other things, but first and foremost, Jesus is a Savior. Do you understand you're called to be saviors in Jesus, the only Savior? Oh, you can't act apart from him, but in him, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. Though I am weak, I am strong. And it is precisely when I am weak that I am strong. I told you a little bit about my dad. Oh, he, he didn't start out so great in life. He grew up Catholic, though. He went to a Catholic school. He was a kind of a sports star and, in school. And, uh, he went, he transferred when they wouldn't let him play first string as a freshman on the public basketball team, you know, the public school. Uh, yeah, he was a very good athlete. He got mad at him and he transferred to the Catholic school. <laughs> and there was an arch rivalry in town between the Catholic school and the public school. This was back in the days when every town had a Catholic school. And so my dad began to play and they, the Catholic school there was much smaller than the big public high school. So dad began to play basketball as a freshman. And the games they played were legendary and, and he, they always beat him. St. Mary's always won the tournaments. So he grew up, he grew up Catholic. He used to wash the Monsignor's car, but uh, he grew up in a town, my hometown. I did not learn until the last couple months about my hometown. I used to, to, to hear um, rumors about it. I'm from Hudson, New York. That's on the Hudson River, about 100 miles north of New York City, 30 miles south of Albany, right on the river. It was a whaling port at one time, a rough place. Now, when I lived there growing up, it was a very pleasant little town to be in, but it had a history. I read a book, somebody sent me a book. Hudson was the biggest center for prostitution in the United States. A little town was known for that more than New York City. And people, all the gangsters used to go up there. And you see what a great place I'm from? <laughs> I don't know why on earth I'm telling you this. <laughs> but in any event, it, it was. That, that's the kind of place that it was. But the pain of the cross is essential. You can't get away from it. I have tried, and I haven't been able to escape. And it keeps coming back to me, don't run from the cross. You run from the cross, you run from love. You run from the cross, you run from power. You run from the cross, you run from salvation. Don't run from the cross. It's the only thing that can save us. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Think about the person you love the most. Now, it might be your spouse, your child, a parent, 
friend. And think about what you wouldn't do to rescue that person from the worst, most evil terrorist that there is. You know, I can't do it for myself. But when God explained it to me that I have to do it for others, it became possible. It became possible to stretch out my arms and accept the cross. Do you understand that if you learn how to do this, you will become a conduit of grace that will be brought down on the world and tremendous good will take place. The power, the unbelievable power of the cross. Well, my dad growing up in that little town with all kinds of relatively bad things going on all around, he didn't know any of that. Even though he went to Catholic schools, I'm sure he had heard some of that, but it never sunk in. He didn't interiorize it. I never did when I was young. And so he went the way of the world. He was a rough guy. He was a physically rough guy. Uh, he was a very handsome man. He was a womanizer, a hard drinker, a hard gambling character. About everything he shouldn't have been. He left us when I was 12. Ran off. Never saw him again for about 15 years. And then about when I was getting ready to be ordained, his sister, my aunt, said, you know, you ought to be reconciled with your father. And uh, so I said, yeah, I agree. And so my dad agreed too. And so we met and talked. And that was when, that, when I told you, remember what he said? He said, I, I wish I could have been a better father. He said, God heard that prayer. God, our Father, heard that prayer loud and clear. And at that very moment, almost at that very week, my father began to enter into redemptive suffering. Uh, he, he developed heart trouble. Well, seven years come and gone, he had 35 plus surgeries. On his three open heart surgeries, I think um, eight bypasses total, valve replacement, surgeries on his spine, surgery on his eyes, surgery on his hands. In the last year of his, two years of his life, he had so much pain from his back, he couldn't lie down to sleep. He had to sit up in a chair in order to rest. I would go to visit him, and he would give me his bed to sleep in. I said, no, Dad, you, you've got to sleep here. No, I can't. And I'd get up 2, 3 in the morning, and. He'd be sitting in the chair, sometimes awake, sometimes asleep. And he became, began to experience more and more pain. I would go to visit him in between my preaching missions. It was hard to look at him. My dad had been a 200-pound strong man, boxer. He lost weight. He never complained, not even once. I never once heard the man complain. At the end, his existence was relegated to a little corner of the patio, which they had turned into a room with a hospital bed for him. He was home. And there he had a picture of me and the Pope. I was being ordained. And he had a crucifix. And he had the rosary the Holy Father had given to me after he ordained me a priest, and I had given to my dad. And he had a little picture of the Blessed Mother. That was his whole world. Now, my dad was never an overtly pious man. I tried to, he tried to read my doctoral thesis. I can't even read it. And I wrote it. I tried to explain to him, I said, Dad, you understand? You understand your suffering? You understand what it is? And he said, well, I have a sense. I have a sense of it. I can't explain it to you, but I have a sense of it inside. He knew. And he suffered, and about every month or so, I'd go to visit him, and he went from bad to worse. I remember 
two years ago, Lent, I was preaching, as I always do during Lent every week, going constantly. One airplane to the next airplane, one parish to the next parish. And in between the missions, I had to get on another airplane to fly to Los Angeles. He had his third open heart surgery, almost killed him. No one would, would do that surgery. They said he'll die. He's got too much heart damage. He found a Japanese surgeon, a very gifted man who was willing to do the surgery and did it at St. Vincent's Hospital in Los Angeles. He almost died on the operating table. I went in. I remember when I walked in to see him, I had preached a mission, flew right down to Los Angeles, rented a car, got down there, and went into intensive care. And there was my father, my big tough guy, 200-pound father, about 80 pounds now. Wasted away, tubes, wearing a diaper like a baby, reduced to utter helplessness. And I looked at him, and I couldn't hardly look at him. And the words leaped into my head like a lightning bolt. It is when I am weak that I am strong. It is when I am weak that I am strong, and I can indeed do all things in Christ who strengthens me. And I stayed for a couple of days, but my dad couldn't move, he couldn't talk. And it went on week after week, and month after month, and finally he was able to have some rehabilitation, began to come back. He had had several of those mini strokes that you'd have when open heart surgery. I, I don't know the exact words, TMs, I think they call them, or something like that. Okay, they, they, and it's, um, but he came back from it. He began to speak again, could move around. And he came back, and I'd go to visit him, and he'd keep suffering. One thing after the next, and all the while, the words came back to me, oh, if I could only be a better father. And my ministry began to grow. And it went from reaching hundreds to thousands and thousands to tens of thousands and tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands. And all the while I thought about my dad lying in that bed in the corner. Towards the end, they'd call me about every week. He's not going to make it. You better come quick. Whenever they'd call, I'd rush down there to give them the anointing of the sick so I could be with them when he passed on. I'd anoint him, and he'd come back. <laughs> Eight or nine times it happened. The doctor said he won't last 12 hours. Go down, anoint him, anointing of the sick. I'll never forget it. Last time they said, this is it, the big one. He's finished. You got to come down right now. I raced to the airport, flew down there, got in the car, raced from the airport to the house, got there, and boy, and he, he was gone. They all gathered around, you know. I anointed him. He was in a coma. His eyes open. <laughs> what are you doing here, Buster? Um, I swear, an hour later, he was sitting at the kitchen table eating a salami sandwich. <laughs> a week later, they called me again. I went down, and he could barely sit in the chair. He's very weak. And I sat with him. He couldn't talk. He was too weak. And I'll never forget the look in his eye. He couldn't speak to me, but his eyes spoke. And his eyes told me that although he had suffered and he was weak, he was happy because he knew that on the cross he was one with Jesus. His eyes were eloquent. He wasn't a beaten man. He was a victorious man. 
And I say goodbye to him. And he died. But he taught me something. He taught me don't ever quit. He taught me don't ever give up. No matter how hard the beating is, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how many times you get knocked down. When I was a kid, when he taught me how to box and I fought in the Golden Gloves, he wasn't the, uh, the fastest boxer in his day, but he was the toughest boxer in his day. Never quit. Just have the attitude, they gotta kill you. Don't you ever quit. Now that carries over into the spiritual life. Many of you have suffered many things. Many of you have suffered much abuse of one kind or another. Many of you have been rejected. Many of you have been the recipients of all kinds of bigotry and prejudice and all kinds of things that are just bad. Don't you dare quit, no matter who you are. Don't you dare lay down and throw the fight. Because at the end of a dusty, tortured road, there is a reward that eye has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it so much as entered into the mind of man what God has in store for those who love him. Please, don't ever forget that. The cross is the way to power. The cross is the way to victory. No pain, no gain, no cross, no crown. And in a little while, in a little while, you and I are going to come to the end of the race. You and I are going to fight this good fight all the way to the end. And when that happens, we're going to stand before Almighty God. We're going to stand before that good God, that great God, that loving and merciful God who so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever would believe in him wouldn't perish come to everlasting life, and that good God, who indeed permitted many evils in your lifetime and mine for the sake of building us up. That good God permits that evil. That good God allows that evil to strengthen you. You know how steel is purified and strengthened? Into fire. Into fire. You know how gold is purified and made more valuable? In the fire in the fire and so it is in the fire that humanity is tested it is in the fire fire the wood of the cross that we are made strong and then at the end having done our job having accomplished the mission i'm going to say to you solemnly as i prepare to depart texas god is going to smile at you God is going to say to you, well done, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the everlasting joy of your master's house. My dear friend, pray for me as I shall for you. God bless you. God love you. And goodbye.